We're running late, so let's let's make a start. Um, I, I, I generally like to get a sense of who we are, partly for me, partly for each other. Uh, there's not a lot of time, so if we could just very quickly uh, go around and just say your name and a, a, a plant that has been living in your consciousness or awareness recently, a plant that just has some significance for you, perhaps, whatever that might be, even if it's not legal. I don't know. <laughs> 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 All plants are legal. All oh, plants are legal. Yeah, right. Okay, you're right. So, uh, if we can just start with your name and a plant that is alive for you right now. Okay. Um, my name is Gaia and uh, lavender. Yeah. Luca, uh, pomegranate. Pomegranate. Nasa, banana. Sara, fig tree. Fig. Fig. I'm a poly apple tree, somebody asked me to assess this morning. Okay. An apple tree? Yeah, poly. Apple tree, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm Kirsty, Chalipodium, Fathead. Okay, Fathead. Yeah. Uh, Carmen, Beach. Mm -hmm. Beach tree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wild garlic? Wild garlic, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, mint. Mint. Okay. Um, another name of the planet, Bindale Domain, it's healing bones. Uh, comfort. Comfort. Uh, knit, knit bone. Mm -hmm. uh, your name and a plant that is important to you right now. Uh, Katie and Comfrey. Yeah. Rosemary. Rosemary, yeah. Angela Orchids. Orchid. Karin Field Poppy. Mm -hmm. Jane potato. <laughs> 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 Nene Alu. Nene Alu. 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 Uh, Adam, you. You tree, yeah. I'm Elaine Breadfruit. Mm -hmm. okay. Garlic. Garlic. Susan, Himalayan honeysuckle. Sorry? Himalayan honeysuckle. Okay. Himalayan honeysuckle, yeah. Teresa, Cyclamen. Cyclamen. Michelle, Lady Smith. Mm-hmm. Fig tree. Fig tree. Jill, Cruz, Cruz. Jill, Cruz. Jill, Yeah. Jam, sunflower. Winter spinach. Winter spinach. Yeah. Anne Marie. Black frogs. Mm -hmm. B. Uh, dogs. Dina, uh, Verbena, or Lemon Verbena. Lemon Verbena. Uh, Jonathan and the ash tree. Pretty big thing. Did you say one, Jonathan? No, no. My name's Johnny, and actually it's rosemary also. Rosemary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, um, in this brief little window of time, uh, I was thinking about this this morning, and uh, the title, Thinking Like a Plant, I realized could have lots of different meanings, some of which I might not have had in mind when I first had the title. Um, because this isn't, uh, let's say, the psychology of rosemary and what rosemary is busy thinking about when we're mucking around with it. What um, I want to explore in the next hour and a little bit is something to do with um, some of the things that struck me in this morning's talk was uh, the phrase that Jonathan Porritt used, a redesign process. So that to me is something that stood out for me. How, how do we kind of undertake a redesign process? And in, in thinking about that, the reason why that's interesting to me is that uh, my sense for that is that the kind of redesign process that I spend time thinking about is partly to do with what we do outwardly 
in the garden, in the soil, in relationships between garden and soil and between people. But to me, I'm also interested in a redesign process in our way of knowing. And in a way, the term thinking like a plant is our thinking. It's not the plant's thinking, maybe. But that question for me is, what are uh, all of the different events that we're all very aware of in the world right now, what are they asking of us in terms of redesigning our systems, if that's our economic system, our political system, our education system, whatever that is. But the feeling that if we only try and tweak the system without actually visiting the way that we're seeing and relating to that system, we're in danger of just moving pieces around on the board. And that moving pieces on the board might help some things, but it might also complicate other things. And if you like, that's a hypothesis. I don't want it to be, this is, but that stands behind the kind of work I've been doing for probably 20 years in trying to understand what part we contribute into the world through our own thinking and perception and interpretation of what, what it is that we're working with. So another way to say this would be, um, and I'm not going to talk for an hour and 15 minutes. I want to actually, in a way, play. But in order for us to kind of get to playing, I'm just going to speak one or two things, and then we're going to explore. But um, if, if I were to say something about where I think some of the chewy issues are, I would say it's because we've become very accustomed not to thinking like a plant or thinking with a plant or thinking with living processes. I would say that our thinking is very much thinking like a mineral. That we have become highly specialized and expert at thinking like a mineral. And the difficulty is, is that when we take that thinking to understand uh, the plant or the animal or the human, we carry over with us the same thinking that opened up the mineral world to us. But, but when that comes over to the realm of the plant and the animal, the difficulty is, is uh, it imposes a mineral-like thinking onto the realms of life. It's a proposal to play with. But this, um, what I'm finding is that this uh, proposal has had a long lineage in the history of science. And, and personally, I feel um, that science suffers from cognitive amnesia. That's not my term. It's a term that comes from uh, the physicist and uh, phenomenolo phenomenologist Henry Bortoff. But he would say that we suffer from cognitive amnesia. And the cognitive amnesia is that we forget that we, in order to see something like a mineral and study it in that way, we have to contribute to it becoming mineral-like through our seeing. It's kind of a big chapter that we don't have chance to go through. But um, recently, I came across a book that you might be familiar with. I, I wasn't. And uh, I came across it, and it really kind of lit my fire for a while, because I thought, wow, that's cool. That's clear. Um, I was going to put a handout together, but it's a good thing I didn't, because I would have been about 10 copies short or 15 copies short. Um, there's a lot of things that I think are interesting to go to in the work we're going to do in the next hour. If you want me to send you stuff, like copies of this article or other sources, uh, put your email on this list, and I will email you PDFs of some of the sources that stand behind it. But this, uh, to me, is, is kind of a great work. And it's not going to be found on a lot of the great work shelves, on the shelf that says great works, but I think it should. And this is written by E.F. Schumacher, and it was published after he died. So a lot of you will will 
perhaps know it, but it's really great to revisit it in this context. And um, I'm just going to read a little bit of it, even though reading from the text is a dangerous thing. So he says, this is a chapter called Levels of Being. And this is a book called Guide for the Perplexed. You might, who's familiar with it? OK, not so common. But uh, uh, E.F. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, Schumacher, yeah. Uh, after he died, a guide for the perplexed is studied. And it's kind of like one of these distillations, which was kind of like, just before I go, I'm going to read this. And it's, it's a good one. And this is what he talks about. He says, our task is to look at the world and see it whole. W-H-O-L-E, see it whole. Um, that to me is a sentence we could kind of meditate for a while. Because to me, the, the little word see and see it whole is not a passive word, it's an active word. Our potential is to see wholeness as an activity rather than to just be passive in that. We see what our ancestors have always seen, a great chain of being, which seems to divide naturally into four sections, four kingdoms, as they used to be called, mineral, plant, animal, and human. This was, in fact, until not much more than a century ago, probably the most widely familiar conception of the general scheme of things, of the consti constitutive pattern of the universe. So he's doing something quite interesting here. He's saying that um, mineral, plant, animal, human, we could also say earth, water, air, and fire were the ways in which we framed our relationship with the world until, I would say, longer than 100 years ago, but definitely until the 1600s, until Boyle kind of publishes the skeptical chemist. That was our language. Earth, water, air, fire, four kingdoms, <coughs> chain of beings. The ancient view begins with the divine and sees the downward chain of being as an increasing distance from the center and a progressive loss of qualities. The modern view, largely influenced by the theory of evolution, tends to start from inanimate matter and consider man or the human being as having emerged through uh, processes which we heard uh, one perspective of this morning, having evolved the widest range of useful qualities. So the one picture that we now carry with us is that matter is primary, if you like, in the great chain of being. It starts with the mineral and it goes on up the chain to plant, animal, human. Now, Schumacher is going to do something quite interesting here, because he's going to come in and say that um, the danger, like I've already said, is that the, once we have studied the mineral kingdom and come to know that mineral kingdom, we tend to apply that way of knowing to other beings in the great chain of being. And Goethe, the poet and scientist, uh, Goethe has a lovely saying. It's, he says it in a poem. And I'm going to paraphrase it and probably massacre his poem in the process. Mm -hmm. So I apologize, wherever he is. And he says, isn't it strange that as we go to nature to study it and understand it, in its deepest sense, as life, as a, as a home of life and spirit, the first thing that we do is kill it, like I've already done this morning, sorry guys, uh, to study it. So he says, science sets out to understand what is it that animates the world, what is it that animates us. And in order to do that, we start to look inside. But in order to look inside, we actually lose the very thing we were setting out to study. So that is something to think about in terms of how do we actually do this. And Schumacher, I think, introduces or reintroduces a beautiful word in 
in this guide to the perplexed. And his proposal is that rather than developing one way of knowing and developing it really well, no critique there, we have really done that well, his challenge is to say, can we now, before we translate that into everything else and killing it in the process, there's a time in around the 15 or 1600s which would say, because we have started to study corpses, we tend to take our way of seeing and turn everything into corpses. Kind of a challenging thing to work with, but that's the proposal. And Schumacher says his question is what way of knowing would be adequate to the mineral, adequate to the plant, adequate to the animal, and then adequate to knowing another human being? And his proposal is, is that they're different because he says if we observe the plant, we'll notice that as we go from mineral to plant, something radical changes. The mineral, especially the amethyst, the amethyst has, is no longer going to go through a process of division and multiplication of cells and adding new crystals to it. And the, the amethyst, if you like, is complete. It has come to a place where it is in a way, wrought work is how we would describe it. The plant, if I don't step in there and interfere, is uh, still in a process of unfolding. If I come back in the tomorrow or the next day, I'll find that something has changed. There might be additional leaves, there might be a change in the leaves, there might be a process that starts that wasn't there earlier in the plant. All of a sudden, the plant is showing me something about itself which is totally different from the mineral. And Schumacher comes to that point and he says, well, words are really tricky to know how to get to grips with that. I'll just call it X for now. So we have mineral, and then when we come to the plant, we have mineral plus X. That might be woefully unsatisfying, but we'll stay with them for a bit. Mineral plus X. And he carries on, and he says, for now, we will say for now that X is um, <coughs> he says X is a radical jump in the chain of being. And then he goes to animal, and of course this is not animal, because this is the mineral that the animal has left behind it after its life process and has moved on. So this is actually M. This is not M plus X. But animal, he says, in his way of uncovering this, is mineral plus X. It has a life process. It grows, it changes, it reproduces, it digests stuff, it puts stuff out. Um, that's plus X. But it also has what he will say a degree of consciousness. Why? So for Schumacher, he's saying, in the great chain of being, we find M, M plus X, M plus X plus Y. And we come to human, there's another piece that comes, shows up, M plus X plus Y plus, he doesn't do anything too unpredictable, Z. But for him, this is um, this radical jump. At each level, there's a radical jump. And what shows up now in the human being is self-consciousness. The ability to say, I am here speaking to you now. Now, this can open up a whole can of worms. Is this session meant to go till four? four. four. Thank you. Okay. So, what he's doing, I think, in a very um, kind of subtle way, but also a radical way, is to ask us to be clear about what it is that we're working with and what way of knowing would be adequate to understanding that other. And um, there's a little exercise we're gonna do in a moment. 
if you can do a head count for me, because it's going to be important. Uh, there's a little exercise we're going to do to play with different ways of seeing. Now, Schumacher didn't go into this in this book, Guide for the Perplexed, very much. He didn't explore in great depth what would these uh, ways of knowing being that would start to be adequate to these different uh, beings that we meet in the great chain of being. But one of the things that uh, various different people explore is that our language has changed over time through history. It also is different in different cultural backgrounds. And uh, English, which has this incredible kind of um, power in the world right now, presence in the world, whatever that is, English is very well suited to the kind of relationship we have with M. We have a very clear grammatical structure which identifies me as a subject separate from the object, and it places us both in the relationship that we're very used to, where I have the impression that I am separate from that mineral and we are of completely different nature. Is that okay? In English, we have a very clear noun structure. So that is a rock, that is a table, that is a pen, that is a phone, that is a window, that is a door, that is a clock, whatever. Uh, the, the cognitive amnesia that Bortoft is talking about is that I don't even think about that anymore. I've walked in the room and I have just mineralized everything really quickly so that I can get on with the lecture. It's a cup, it's a, you know, boom. Got it. And um, I mentioned Goethe earlier, and, and, and Goethe was interesting because Goethe said there's another way of um, being with, meeting, working with the other. He did a lot of work with plants. And a way to kind of come at that with language is to really kind of explore what the nature of the verb does in our language. And rather than kind of relate to some, I can relate to the plant in my noun-like mineral way. That is rosemary. Rosemarinus officinalis, or whatever, I've got it, bang. And that's very handy, because it kind of sets up a set of relationships which we're actually very used to. That's rosemary. But Goethe introduced a term into his uh, work and Goethe talked about becomings he said when we come to work with the plant I mean he actually would take this right down into the mineral but the, the becoming of the mineral is a much 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 bigger process than the becoming of the plant the, 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 the way the mineral lives in time is very different than the way the plant lives in time. But th this is the result of a becoming. And from that point of view, we can, we can imagine the becoming of that geode forming in the magma and the silicates starting to work into the center of the geode and the silicates getting um, doped, we would say now, with manganese and getting purple and growing in this particular way. But all of a sudden, in order to do that process, we've shifted our way of seeing from an intellectual, analytical way of seeing to what Goethe would be called an imaginative way of seeing. And he talked about becomings. Uh, in language, a way to relate to that would be to think about verbs. And there's a very interesting um, Poet, I don't know if you, uh, anybody here poets? There's a poet called William Stafford, he's an American poet. And William Stafford got really intrigued by uh, the, the, phenomen the phenomena that many Native American languages didn't have a clear noun structure. So you may have heard about this, that when they studied things like Lakota and Hopi and all these different languages, there wasn't a noun structure. It was all based on verbs. And uh, Stafford took this idea as a poet and went, whoa, there's some creative juice in that. How would it be to write a poem 
where my relationship to everything is inverted. And um, I don't have, I do have the poem with me, but I'm not going to dig it out because of time. But the, the phenomenon that he wrestles with is we make the shift inwardly from this being a table, which is in a way a thing stuck in space now that has no relationship to me, to only being here present for me to table because I am tabling it. By doing this with it, I am tabling it. But if I just kind of clear the decks and lie on it and put a pillow on it, I'm bedding it. You're currently chairing that chair because your relationship to chair in that active sense is to chair it. So there I'm just going to chair it. But before I chair it, our relationship to it is more ambiguous. Right now it's a coat hanger. Uh, for your daughter or whatever, it's like, oh my god, it's a boat today and it's a house tomorrow and it's Dolly's kind of castle kingdom the next day and it's where my book goes the next day and it's the source of um, unforeseen battles with your siblings the next day because it's my chair, my kingdom. So it's not got this kind of staticness that we think it has, that we give it. We are the active agent in putting it in the museum of chairness. That's the gift of our consciousness, is to be able to say, I have the gift to be able to fix you as a chair. And my language, as an expression of consciousness, is playing into that. And um, Stafford gave himself the exercise, which I would recommend, would be to find somewhere to go out in nature, out, out in the city, in wherever you are, and just try and write about how it is to be in that space, experiencing in a, in a realm of verbs. All is becoming. And all is becoming and arising and all is passing away. We start to touch into different uh, aspects of the spiritual traditions that were rooted in all is becoming and all is passing away. But um, how do we how do we kind of get that? Is this okay? Where we're yeah. kind of mm -hmm. does anybody have any? Is that a hand going up? No. Anybody have a hand that wants to go up with anything to add or ask? Or? No. <laughs> okay. So. Um, What, what Schumacher is definitely pointing to is that suggesting maybe or offering for our contemplation is that we, we could ask ourselves now whether a way of thinking that has been totally suited is totally suited to one realm of the great chain could start to shift now as we try and understand things that don't neatly categorize into this is not that, into an analytical process, into a process of classification based on number of parts or atomic weights or number of petals in the flowering parts of the flower or whatever that is. All of those beautiful things come out of this is like this and it's not like that. Comes out of a very particular way of seeing, which we now, uh, our gift, our, our inheritance, if you like, our um, birthright is to ta have that consciousness through our education, through everything that is telling us um, that I am a thing. And I'm not only a thing, I have a very particular number that identifies me. I've got tons of them. I don't know which number to use any day because I've got so many. But that's who I am now. But there's a, that's true, and there's another part of me which sometimes is in ra rather almost conflict with that, if not um, 
dissonance with that maybe, I'm not quite sure what the language is, but which is I am a continuous becoming. Continuous becoming. Physiologically, yes, because everything I'm producing, somewhere close to a million blood cells out of my thigh bones in front of you right now. A fountain of life. So are you, and so are you, and so are you, and so are you. But I don't see a fountain. It would be kind of overwhelming to just see fountains of life. But in that fountain, I would also experience that we are all in that realm connected very deeply in the processes that are generating our life. So this is uh, probably a dangerous thing to kind of dabble in in an hour and a bit. But um, one way to come at it then is to play. So the way that we're going to play is like this. What's our head count? Got 30. OK. With me included or not? Not 31 with you. OK, so I'm at 30. We need groups of three. And um, what we're going to do is if you take, uh, everybody take a piece of paper, please. So everybody should have one. I've got more if there's not enough. We were working on 20 in the room. So we're going to explore. Anybody not have a pen? Johnny, do you want to sit there or where do you go? Anybody not have a pen? One paper each. This is going to be a radical exercise in instructions. Who hasn't got a piece of paper? Did you get one? Who does not have a piece of paper? Your very own. Okay. Or a pen? Or a pen. Okay, we're good. Okay. So far, so good. It's good. It might get worse. So, in each group of three, I'm going to give you one of these plants. And um, we're going to do a little exercise. And the exercise goes like this, and this is where I hope I don't lose you. So, I'll come at it in this way. You each will have the opportunity to explore this other, I'll just say for now, otherness uh, in the following ways. Because we're all, we're going to actually write poems. And don't now crash and burn because you're not a poet. We're going to do them together. It's very safe and fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're English or not. You know, you can just okay. add Chuck in another language. We'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> so, another way to talk about this way of seeing for Schumacher, it's to do with or Schumacher talks about the mineral as M. I am positing the proposal that we have developed mineral consciousness very well. The perspective that I'm going to call that is it. I can look at that and my relationship to it is as an it. My relationship to it. It's embedded in my language. It is a table. It's, it's a stone. It's, it's, it is a plant. I can have the experience though that uh, and, but this is very difficult in 15 minutes. But right, if I sit with this for a week, <laughs> was that the right moment? Captain yeah. <laughs> 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 Am 
Now I sit with that thing for a week. Um, it's going to way outdo me in terms of patience and movability <laughs> and all this. I'm going to do a lot more changing than it is in a month. Given the right conditions, I'm going to turn into one of those before it does anything <laughs> too exciting, given the right conditions. <laughs> we, could, we could play with that, but anyway. Um, Goethe's way of working with the plant realm was to realize that if we really want to understand plantness, we actually need to be there to accompany it in, in its life process. We want to watch this thing when it was way down here in a little bud. And then that little bud put out two little side shoots that each put out uh, a meristem and leading leaves and went like that. And then it grew and it hit a point like that and it rotated and put two out like that. And, it, and so actually, there's a way to look at that and be with it so that rather than it becoming an it or a thing, it becomes a dynamic. It becomes a becoming, a verb. And that can only happen if inwardly I shift from looking at the plant to looking with the plant. Almost even then our language is a problem. But to go from looking at is what we just do every day with what everything because it gets us to work and it gets us home and it gets dinner cooked and the bills paid and it's great. But to look with is to then start to realize that we're in a complete, we're in a, especially with these, we're in a process of metamorphosis, continuous metamorphosis, that if we were to try and uh, meet it adequately or in that space of adequatio, we would have to become verb-like in our seeing and comprehending. And all of a sudden, that thing shifts. I can only describe it to you now. Uh, I don't want you to take it on faith, but go play with it. But I'll describe it in this language. All of a sudden, it goes from being an it, possibly, to being a you. All of a sudden, there's something else comes in. And to address the other is a very different relationship than to just get your number, or your weight, or your height, or your eye color, or your genetic disposition, or whatever. Okay? So all of a sudden we've gone to you. And these are gonna be our voices, and I'm just gonna ask you in a moment to play with one plant where you are choosing to it it, and you are choosing to shift something inside you that goes from it being an it to you feeling like, oh, you. Very difficult to do in 15 minutes because that, that relationship, relationships take time to build. You might you know, fall immediately in love or whatever, but um, maybe not. So, so we're just kind of uh, leapfrogging a process, which is a process in time. But explore playfully, what does it mean to go from it to go to you? And then there's another perspective we're going to explore. This is very tricky to introduce in this time frame, and so we're going to um, risk it. Which is actually to experience the other. And um, this work. Uh, Adequatio is a tricky thing because what does it mean to actually know something so intimately that you feel like you could say I, and I am speaking for rosemary or lavender or whatever. We're going to keep it playful right now because um, that kind of space, just a little anecdote in time, uh, the way to do this is to... Uh, to do justice to it is to find a plant. That's why we went around today and I said, what plant is kind of capturing in your interest right now? And to be with that plant, to participate in that plant's life process. So to give you a story, I used to live in the foothills in the Sierras, up, up in the California, up um, in the Sierras in California. And um, I 
gave myself the task of being with plants as they grew. And so I planted two seeds of two different plants, and every day I'd sit down with them. Um, we didn't share anything too intimate. I did, didn't spill the beans in the beginning. But I would just watch them grow. And I would do a little sketch of how they grew, and then I'd go away and I'd try and kind of imagine, well, how was that? You know, was it like this? Or was it like this? Or, you know, how was it? And um, the funny thing is, is because I had put these two seeds in pots, I started to get actually a bit bored. I kind of thought, well, hold on a second, it's in a pot. You know, I put it there, that's not where it would grow. And every day I was going for a little walk. And um, on one of my walks, this was kind of like April, May. And uh, anybody been in California in April, May, in the foothills? So what happens in the foothills is the taps get turned off about March, early April. And that means no rain, seasonal drought from there until the autumn. Often not a cloud in sight. So if you watch the plant life in California, you know, you risk being thrown out by the botany department, but they kind of know that the taps are gonna get turned off. So they go through their life process really quickly Spring comes, the snow, if there is snow at that, at that altitude, goes. The plants grow. They go into flowering quickly. They go into seeding quickly. They kind of go, you know what? I know what's coming, and I'm going to get this thing through quickly. So it's kind of April, May, and I'm going for a little walk around. And uh, all of a sudden, everything is kind of like uh, that, like just papery, dry, we made it, we've done it, we've put our seeds in for next year, but it's now, you know, the heat and dryness takes you over. And I was walking along, and all of a sudden I came to this place, and there were these two green leaves, like, pushing through the soil um, with this incredible, uh, I am just starting out, folks, and I have a lot of life in me, and I was blown away. That was my feeling. It was like, who are you? And don't you know that it's drought time? I mean, what the hell are you doing starting now? And that kind of, um, that, that's how a good relationship starts, you know? It's kind of like, what the hell? And so every day I'd go back and it would kind of grow a little bit more and grow a little bit more. And it was the year, I think, that I actually, at the end of that year, moved to the UK. And I accompanied that thing. There was not a day went by that I wasn't there watching what was next and what are the flowers going to look like when they open. And I'm still blown away by the flowering process of this plant. It's just so incredible. And that year, though, I watched all the flowers. Um, I watched insects come to the flowers, but there was no fruiting process. And I thought, oh, man, I don't know how you fruit. How, what kind of fruits do you like? But I had developed such a kind of relationship to that plant that when I went back again to teach in California and visit in-laws, I borrowed a car and drove two hours up there to that patch of that ground to say, did you make flat, uh, fruits? And sure enough, you know, there was a fruiting process. And it's like, okay, now I have a picture of your becoming. And that's just kind of a sense that, that is only to say we're jumping that whole process. We, we, we're not coming into the time body of the plant or to the time process or to the life process or whatever we want to call it. However, that being the case, we're going to play. So everybody has a little piece of paper, which I hope is still blank. If it isn't, grab another one. And in groups of three, uh, form, while I'm talking, form a little group of three, a little cluster around one plant. And you don't have time to kind of form a committee and yes. decide which plant it's going to be. You just have to kind of choose a plant. Okay, so groups of three.
Who is only in a group of two? We have two plants. So, okay. There should be, so Johnny, there should be one other person. You guys are in a group there? Yeah. So we've got one so group of three, one group of three. Three people plants? Yeah. One group of three. You three in a group of six? Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, you want to be in a group of ten? Okay. Is everyone in a group? I'm sorry, yeah. group. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. The way that we're going to do this, so that everybody gets a chance to try and wear these different, or step inside these different ways of seeing, is the following. In your group, everybody in the group puts a little line on the top of their page like that. Okay. And then in your group of three, you decide amongst you, for now, who is going to write the word it up here. One person in your group of three is going to write the word it up there. Another person in your group is going to write the word you up top. And another person in your group is going to write the word Letter I. Yeah. Are we with? Yeah. Ah, okay. We've got sheet each. On three sheets? No, no, on one sheet. Just on your sheet, you're either going to be I or you. You're either going to be I or you. You're going to be I or you. Now we have to write So you up here, you put the word it, you put the word you, you put the word I. But not on the top line, just above it. Just like up here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen up. <laughs> yes. So listen up, listen up, listen up. I told you this was going to be risky. Okay. So, here's here's my piece of paper. I'm in this group of three. I'm hijacking for 30 seconds. Okay. I'm going to put a line here in my group of three. I'm going to put the word it here, and then I'm done. Okay. Then my partner here is going to put the word I you. Okay. So, on their piece of paper. On their piece of paper. <laughs> okay. Then, this is what happens. The one danger here is that this becomes an exercise, which is kind of the plant is irrelevant, because we just start to have fun and leave the plant behind. <laughs> So as much as possible, try and keep this dialogue with the plant going. It's kind of a, it's a movement between engaging with the plant and listening. But what you're doing is this. My paper says it on it and I have one word. And I'm going to start a little poem because in my first word, I'm going to put the word, uh, this is totally inane, but it's going to do, I'm going to just put you know, it's green. I'm starting a poem with the word green. Why? Because that's, I looked at it and it's green. But you're going to look at it and you're going to look at it in terms of you. And your response to that might be something that isn't about how it looks or its color. It might be whatever feeling arises for you in that. The other person is going to look at it from the perspective of I, which is really tricky really tricky and it's what the plant starts to speak to you is that clear <laughs> and then something else is going to happen so only go that far 
Yeah. One word. One word. Okay, well you're gonna have, it's gonna grow, but for now, everything grows from a little seed and then it starts to go. Okay, and one last instruction. One last instruction. If we can do it in silence or where we minimize speaking, it will be better because our language will keep pulling us into particular ways of seeing. Our language pulls us very strongly in particular directions. So if you need to speak, it's just not because I'm saying shut up in nice terms. It's just in this kind of space we're trying to find, uh, especially with some of these, it actually leaves our language in a different way. Maybe, try it. You have one word. So engage from the perspective that you have, it, you, or I. A word will come to you, put the word down. Okay, do that now. The aim is not to write the best poem that's ever been written in the Friends Meeting House. The, the, the aim of this exercise is to see if you, inwardly, can experience what it's like to shift your way of seeing. That's what the exercise is about. So in order to see how it is for us to shift that relationship, if the person who has the word it were to stay there they would not experience these other two and they would experience something of what we have as an everyday experience so just to make this even more dangerous you now pass the page so that try and find a system because you're going to do this a few times so you pass the page you find time to adjust inwardly. I might be building a room full of schizophrenics here, but we'll <laughs> try and deal with that. You shift inwardly, and now I started with an it perspective, and I said green. Now all of a sudden, I'm in a you perspective that's already starting to build, though. So I look through the you perspective, but I also respond to what my colleague put before, and I respond out of that. But this time I've got two words. Now I'm allowed two words. Two words. Two words. They can be any part of speech. They can be anything. It doesn't even have to be a word word. It might be um, the perspective of the paper that you have. Yes. Yes. Leave behind the perspective you were in to begin with and adopt this one. And you have two words in order to start to build this. So when you're ready, only when you're ready, you're going to pass again and you have three words. Can three words also be like a sentence? They can be a sentence. They can be um, 
descriptive sounds, they can be, yeah, it can be a sentence, definitely. Okay. Definitely. By the time you get to three, you're starting to have the possibility for sentences. Right. But find time to shift. Again, the idea is that you experience or try to experience a shift from it, you, I, or I, you, it, or however that's working in your group. So I'm going to leave this in your groups now, but what you're going to do is you're going to go to four words, three words, two words, one word. You're making a little poem that's shaped like a diamond. And it grows and expands up to four words, and then it comes down again to this little one word at the bottom. And in the process, you're passing and just massaging different ways of seeing, trying them on. Four, that four line, you're moving to three. Are you going back to three now? You're going back to three, okay. back to two, back to one. Okay. Yeah. One, two, three, four, three, two, one. Look again.
If you find that you're thinking a lot for what the perfect word is, dive into your observing and relating out of that perspective so that what comes to you in the writing emerges as, in a, as the way to frame what you're experiencing, not trying to pull in the right word to describe. That creative process is an emergent process. You know? Don't judge what comes out. Are you done? That group? Just, yeah. We're done. Great. You are. Yeah. Hands up if your group needs more time. Risking, <laughs> risking a, a forcing of the poetic muse. We've got one minute left to play. So, I know. We'll hear some more. Yeah, yeah. And I think I will. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm just going to grab your attention. You can listen up. <laughs> if you're still working in a little group, that's fine. Carry on for a moment. Um, carry on until you come to that last word. So to begin with, before we visit some of the some of these poems, uh, any reflections on how of the, the experience of doing that? The experience of shifting in these perspectives. Well, yeah, we found none of us wanted to do the it, and it didn't come easily to do the it, and our it page is not very it. Okay. It's not very mineral. You were rebels when it came to it. <laughs> it was hard to go back to the it. I started with the it, so I'm probably on an advantage. But when I got got it back, it's like, yeah. Okay, hard to go back to the it. Any other experiences? I think the eye is nice, but it's also very difficult because, again, it's like I cannot see the eye. I only see what I want it to be for me. Yeah, okay, that's an incredibly tricky thing to do. I mean, that, we're doing it so that we can explore also the difficulty of it because to come to that depth of knowing is that we need to invest time and attention. Yeah. It's just that there's such a difference of the feeling in each situation. That there's a more a sort of emotional or cold. Yeah, and you could experience that. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
which one does? The whole thing? Well, kind of the whole thing, but it's really cool to be alive. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely English myself, but the whole it thing where people in received pronunciations just tell you the Latin name and so on, it feels like, you know, this is very, like, you know, what you said about the mineralized form and, and the way. I feel a sort of condescension in people where they, where they talk about plants in that way. Mm -hmm. So um, I was trying to find a different way of doing that, maybe. Mm. Still preserving a distance, but not in such a Yeah. So in the history of science, it's very interesting when somebody said uh, comfrey or knit bone was the plant they were thinking of. And knit bone would have had hundreds of common names, depending often on its use, sometimes on its way of growing, uh, whatever it was. And so it, it kind of came out of that U space. And then there is something about, on the one hand, the beauty, and on the other hand, the price we pay for saying that's its binomial name, that's its classification, that's where it sits. Boom. Okay, but we can maybe feel some of that, that, that there's something happens Everybody now has the same reference to it, but we also sacrifice uh, local knowledge which often arose out of relationships with the other. At one point, a lot of our plants come out of the doctrine of signatures, and the signature of the plant often was, um, came about because the plant had the same dynamic as the organ in the body did. Liverwort, lungwort, wombwort, motherwort, you know, whatever it is. It was something that related to that process in the human body. Liverwort was there because of its gesture. And now we take a little step back and we say, it is this, potentially. So just in the interest of time, let's, um, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to hear all 30 of them. But anyway, let's hear some of these. So. If we, if you can, somebody, if you can hold up the plant we've been working with, and then you choose which perspective you want to share with us, or which alt perspectives. Be nice to hear all three. What came out of that? Uh, but speak loudly, please. It's kind of a tricky um, acoustic in here. So, it for lavender, fragrant, light green and silver, growing in fractals, green, tall, purple, skinny. Three violet flowers is dying compost. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Okay, you. Yeah. Blooming, strong film, growing, seeding, dying, living small white thing, take me outside, uh, beginning and end. I. Hi. 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 Okay. Maybe it would be nice to be guessing which perspective it was. Okay, so with your group we're going to guess, yes, which perspective it was. <laughs> okay, yep, can we hear the third one? Beautiful, it calms, looking for sun, happy in my place, surviving, propagating, living, gorgeous, calm, I. Okay, good. Let's just hear. Let's let's hear some of these ripple around. Are we okay to go with? We're not going to name the voice. We're just going to hear the poem. Yep. Here we go. So, which plant? Struggle, hairy rocking. You are me. Dance my own jobs. Guess on my side. But wrong. Glow. Okay. Another one. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nifi. decoration looking very uh, oh, nice. yeah. Again? Yeah. Leafy, sticky decoration looking very healthy. Ondulating around the stem, perfect research object is then Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Life, pro dancing, not so different. 
giving peace to people, behave so strongly, move unconsciously, move. The last okay. one? Yeah. That was with you. Yeah. The first one was the I. So in terms of what the plant is, uh, it just comes from out back by the Quaker building. I'm not that familiar with it. It's either a rock rose or, or a buddleia or something. It's, like a, that. But it's a baby buddleia. It's a buddleia. I think it's a buddleia. OK, another group. Smells. Smells. Stillness. Stillness not. Is fresh and green, will be dug, too soon, dies. You, I don't, ah. Sorry. Yeah. Roots are beautiful, want to leave, speak silently to me. Present your flowers, organic matter are. Hmm. Grow, miss knowledge, dirty yeah. to maturity. No, I am dying. I taste immortal, heavenly scent, soul. swirling, spread wildly, poetic, share in one world, fly with wind, reach unpredictable love. <laughs> Art seeds life, feeds my mother, great will to survive, wildly flows intuitively, breathes life, green. Light, busy serve, Gracefully becoming seed, fly and soar vicariously, move in harmony, will live, radiate. So what were the different perspectives in that group? Which one was the it perspective? Plus. Was it, were you it? No, it's nobody. She was. Ah, she was it. That's great. I thought it was that. Okay, how many people, hands up if you haven't read yet? Let's just see how many we still have yet to go. Okay. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions and feedback. Is anybody really <laughs> desperate to read a poem? <laughs> the wrong way to put it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so let's hear this one. Lonely and proud, life still possible, have nothing to do with soft lushness, closed capillaries. Live. <laughs> so let's hear the others in that group. Tempered, growing, dying. 
on your journey, bearing winter's red jewels, sense sun above with dignity transmitting. Responding to animals' mouths, can't grow anymore, conserving energy, bouncing. Yeah. Racist could really drop it in bounce. <laughs> uh, okay, I just open it up to five minutes. Um, comments, reflections, questions, anything. So just open it up about the exercise or about uh, where we've been in the last hour of it. How, how can we, is it practice? that we can differentiate when we're looking, doing with the eye, the eye work, that we're not anthropomorphizing mm -hmm. for the plant and seeing it as, as being a reflection of, of my emotions. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you could say that in, in the history of science, there comes a point where we say uh, that the great danger in coming to truth or certainty is me and my projections or my expectations or my wishes or whatever it is. And to me, uh, there's a whole crucial piece in this whole question of scientific method and um, even then scientific convention as to what we do with our so-called subjectivity. And you could say it is a danger that we anthropomorphize, but even that is a perspective that has rooted in it a sense that the human being uh, poisons the well in its perception of that objective world. That there's a kind of a trick there that shows up. So a decision is made that we're going to try and remove ourselves from the experiment so that we don't influence it. That's one response to that realization that this might be a danger. To save ourselves from that danger, let's just kind of make sure that we're out of the mix. And what I think is fascinating is that that attempt proves to be impossible. So, and it happens in one of the most rigorous and objective and empirical, I hope I can use all that language, sciences, physics. So physics keeps opening up the Russian doll to say, I mean, somewhere in there is really the thing that makes the whole thing tick. And then it gets to the point where it says, but I will never know because it depends on me choosing how to look and interpret what I'm seeing. And that's 1950, the uncertainty principle. And then there's the quantum bit where so everything quant moves quantum shows up and then the quantum uh, people go in quite different directions in quantum. Some, what starts to happen in that moment is that irrationality crops up in the most rational science. And this is a big threshold. And some physicists, great physicists, no critique, um, even those who really recognize the uncertainty principle said, well, okay, we can still work with our analytical, mathematical way into this way of knowledge, but we have to accept that there are hidden variables in our equation. And the hidden variable, according to some other physicists like Pauli, Pauli says the hidden variable is a way for you to try and hold desperately to the rational project when actually what's showing up is that there is something coming in that we can't grasp with our intellect and our logic. And Pauli is a remarkable physicist, and he starts to not publish in his books, but he publishes in his letters all of his research that he's doing into alchemy. And he's written a book this thick on Jakob Burma, and he's got letter after letter after letter that starts to realize that rather than coming to the either, either or a particle or a wave as the collapse of science, he's realizing that we have to go to polarity where it is particle and wave, and can we think both at the same time? Is that P-A-W-L-E-Y? P-A-U-L-I, Wolfgang Pauli. And he realizes that uh, the alchemical worldview was based on polarities. <laughs> its whole way of seeing was based on 
Um, earth, water, air, fire, the polarity between air and earth, the polarity between water and fire, the circle of the elements, it was all based on polarity, uh, which is not comfortable for the it perspective. It is a particle. Dang, it's a wave. Uh, something shows up in the work there that is a dilemma for the soul. And um, Pauli's written, there's a great book called Beyond the Atom, where Pauli's letters are published about all of his work on alchemy. But the, the danger, the, the trick there is that that's a lonely path. And the lonely path is to say, I'm actually going to stay true to what my science is showing me, and I'm going to try and take on another perspective, which is like going from earth to water, noun to verb things to becomings, um, stuff to dynamic processes that you can't nail, pin in the board, because they're shifting. As soon as you pin it, it's not it anymore. And that's, the, so the trick is, is there a way to go about a process of knowing where we don't exclude our subjectivity, but we refine it along the way? so that we come to try and perceive where we are anthropomorphizing, which is a danger, but also where our organs of cognition include feeling and sensitivity. And then we also realize that it's, it, the whole story is different in a way. The whole story changes. And the danger of anthropomorphism, yeah, I, I would say we have to dig in there a little bit because it also sits within from uh, Schumacher has a great paragraph here. And he says, um, the normal way of thinking that we have is to start with the mineral. We start with the stuff. And we somehow find stories to say, out of stuff, life kind of happens by chance in a soup a long time ago. And out of life kind of happening somehow in a soup, um, it organizes itself somehow into quite complex relationships. And then further down the road, through quite a lot of chance variation and natural selection and the survival of the fittest, consciousness shows up. And uh, Schumacher says, the problem with that is that we don't see that happening. The difficulty is, is that we can't observe that. What we do observe is stuff that started as a complete fluid in a fluid medium that started to differentiate, that was alive, that grew sensitivity, and died and left behind the footprint of its life process. We're always seeing the mineral falling out of life processes. So he says, we could start, rather than starting with mineral in the great chain of being, we could start with humans and go down the other way as our ontology. Such a downward scheme is easier for us to understand than the upward one, simply because it can be based on practical experience. We know that all three factors, X, Y, and Z, can weaken and die away. We can, in fact, deliberately destroy them. Self-awareness can disappear while consciousness continues. Consciousness can disappear while life continues. And life can disappear, leaving an inanimate body behind. We can observe and, in a sense, feel the process of diminution to the point of the apparently total disappearance of self-awareness, consciousness, and life. But it is outside our power to give life to inanimate matter, to give consciousness to living matter, and finally to add the power of self-awareness to conscious beings. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is like, that paragraph is massive. And it's massive because it, if we were to kind of uh, chew on it for a while, uh, it changes our whole cosmology, our ontology, everything. Is this chapter available somewhere? Yeah, I'm going to email that out as a PDF. If your name's on the um, email list, I'll give you that chapter as a PDF. But I hope it leads to the book, because the book, it's just a little thing like this. Often the really juicy ones are like these thin little <laughs> things. They're not the big weighty, you know, opus magnus. This is my whole thing. Can I just ask what's what do you think is relevant to permaculture? It's relevant. Sort of conclusion. Yeah, it's relevant to permaculture for me because um, I 
uh, studied permaculture a long time ago in, in New Zealand and Australia. And there's a lot of it that to me is really cool and uh, very interesting, but I've always struggled a little bit with this, with what is a system? And am I coming into a system to move parts around in a way that I really understand the life processes that link those parts? Or am I moving pieces on the chessboard? And I, this is a, it's not a criticism. It's my own process that I'm sharing with you. There's a lot of that work that is wise, deeply informed, and uh, practical, and deeply effective. For me, personally, there's a question about whether I am, my understanding is adequate to the plant life. And my understanding of permaculture was also in the early days when I was more involved in design. There was a lot of working with species to bring into systems that eventually were realized we can't do that because that species in that context starts to behave in ways that we didn't predict. And it starts to either dominate that system or it starts to exclude others in that system. And the trick is, though, that sometimes that's not an experiment we can afford to take on. The, the ramifications of some of the experiments we've done are massive, huge in that way, sometimes consciously and sometimes not. So California's star thistle was introduced consciously. California's star thistle covers the Sierras, and there is nothing actually to compete with the star thistle. The cane toad beetle was introduced or the cane toad was introduced to deal with the cane toad beetle, you could say, that's good systems thinking. <laughs> if the cane toad beetle is a problem in the cane stuff, introduce the predator to the cane toad beetle. But if you're, uh, if you're not able to encompass this, the system on that macro level, you've just introduced a cane toad problem, which we have. This is fundamental. I don't know if it's exactly the critique of permaculture. It's yeah. the next level. And that's, that's if we start to uh, broaden our awareness, but don't change our level of consciousness. I think. I think. That's my hypothesis. That's my playful experiment. Is where, where, where is our consciousness adequate to start to work with the living world? And I've just written a book which explores this, contrasting the creation of the Enviro pig, which is a pig crossed with mice genes and E. coli bacteria, in order to solve an agricultural problem, which is high phosphates in pig effluent. But my question there is, why are you tweaking the pig when you shouldn't be feeding the pig feed in high phosphates and putting them in pens of thousands of hogs? But anyway. Our response there is to alter the pig. The Enviro pig created in my hometown, Enviro, University of Guelph, it was in its 10th generation before they realized that they couldn't get it through the FDA for general consumption. And I contrast that with a practice that comes out of biodynamics, which is to take oak bark and stick oak bark in the cranial cavity of a domestic animal and put it in the ground in the winter and then use it as a compost. That's just wacky. That's absurd. That is woo-woo. Or is it, is my question. What is a way of knowing that would be adequate to realize that there is a complete relationship between the bark of the oak tree, not beech or maple or whatever, but oak tree, cranial processes in the development of a mammal, winter, and a particular process that's happening in the biochemistry of the compost. But in that context, if our thinking, if our thinking doesn't change, putting stuff in animal organs and putting it in the ground, you should probably be locked up or sent on holiday or something. I don't know what. But um, I'm just interested in are we aware of what we're doing and the level of consciousness now? Sometimes you have to do something. Definitely, yeah. What is your book called, please? Oh, I'm not allowed to advertise it here. Turn your fingers on. It's a secret. <laughs> it's called Muck and Mind. Huh? Muck and Mind? 
Luck and mind. So it's um, what I'm excited about is to be studying and learning more about permaculture and organics and biodynamics and quantum. Just to try and get my head around what's, what the story is, because you know there's still a lot of stories that we tell as fact. And they, they are presented to us as fact, and yet they are still really working hypotheses. Anyway, that's, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.